So get out your Crayola, because it's time to start coloring knots. In this video, we're going to look at what the definition is of K coloration. How do I color a knot using K colors? And we're going to take that definition and realize it as an arithmetic and then as an algebra problem. And that's going to give us the hook into thinking about how colorations lead to higher algebraic structures that we hope will be complete invariants for knots. So a K coloring of a knot diagram is nothing more than a function from the set of arcs in that knot diagram into the integers from 0 up to k minus 1. That's just a fancy way of saying for each of the arcs in the diagram, we're going to assign it one of these numbers from 0 through k minus 1. So we have a total of k different colors that we can work with. So I'm thinking of each of these integers as representing some color or another. Um, and we require that at every crossing of the knot diagram, one of two things needs to be true. Either the colors that we assign to all of the three arcs that meet at that crossing are all the same, or the other option is that the three colors of arcs that meet at that crossing need to all be different. Right? So at every crossing, we need to either have all the colors the same, or we need to have all the colors different. And we can mix and match at different crossings in the diagram, but every crossing has to satisfy one or the other of these two things. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like. So here's a diagram of the knot 5-1. And if I'm going to ask a question about colorability, what I want to know is whether it's going to be possible at each of the crossings in this diagram for either all three of the colors that I assign to the arcs that meet at that crossing are all the same. So in this example here, I've colored all three of them with the same integer 0, or the same color red, if you like. So this kind of crossing will be OK. All three of the colors the same. Or the other possibility is that at a crossing, I might assign one arc a 0 another arc of 1, another arc of 2, for example. So all three of them are different at a crossing. That's fine, too. And again, we can mix and match. So at maybe at one crossing, I have all the colors are the same. At a different crossing, I might have all the colors are different. But at every crossing, one or the other of these two has to hold if we are to have a K coloration of this knot. So I can ask a question, like, is the knot 5-1 that I've diagrammed here on the screen, is it three colorable? So if you give me three crayons, can I color in the arcs on this diagram in such a way that at every one of the crossings, one or the other of these is true? Either all the colors are the same, or all the colors are different. Well, let's explore. Let's pick one arc out of my diagram. Maybe I'll pick this one right here. And I'm just going to assign it some color. Let's say I color it the color zero, or red in this case. Co color this one arc. And then ask at this next crossing, do I want this to be a crossing where all my colors are the same, or all the colors are different? Well, if I'm going to try to use all three of my crayons, let's suppose that I say, well, let's make all three colors at this crossing distinct from one another. So to do that, I'll color the next under arc over here green, and then that's going to force me to color the other arc, the third arc that meets at this crossing, the other color. So that means that I have to have red, green, and blue all meeting at that one crossing. Okay, now we have to chase down the consequences of that decision in the rest of the diagram. So at the next crossing right here, I've got a blue arc coming in, a number two. I've got a green arc, a number one. And I have another arc that I haven't colored yet. Well, because two of these colors are different, that must mean, in order to satisfy one of these conditions, that the third color must also be different from those two. So that forces me to color that next arc red, so that I have red, green, and blue all meeting at this crossing. Now again, I have red and green meeting at this crossing, so that forces me to color the next arc blue. But then I also have two reds coming into this crossing, which forces me to color this strand red. And so you can see that that creates a problem. Because whether I color this strand blue and get a conflict over here where I have two blue but not three meeting at this one place, or if I color this red so that I have all three of these the same, now I have two reds meeting at this crossing up here, Whichever way we do it, we end up with a problem. Because the one thing that we cannot do is we cannot have two arcs of one color and another arc of, the third, of, a, of a different color right at a crossing. That's the one thing we can't do uh, if we're going to three color or not. So OK, that coloration plan didn't work. So it doesn't seem like I can color this knot in a way where I have distinct colors at this crossing. So let's try again, just making the other choice. I'm going to start the same way, color this one arc here red, the color 0. And now I'm going to choose to make all of the colors at this crossing the same instead of different. So that forces me to color those arcs red and red. All right, so now we're in pretty good shape. If I look at this crossing, now I have two arcs that are both red coming into this crossing, which is going to force me to color the next arc also red, the same color. 
because as soon as I have two of a given color at a crossing, I must then also have the third of that same color so that I can satisfy this first of the two conditions. But if that arc is red, that means that I again have two reds coming into this crossing, and so I need to color this arc red. And what I end up doing is coloring the entire diagram red, which is okay. That's, that follows my rules, right? But it's boring somehow, right? Because we had three crayons, but we only ended up using one of them. So if we're not actually using all K of our colors and our coloration, we'll call that a trivial coloring or an uninteresting coloring somehow, right? So we can always trivially use a single color to color in an entire knot and just satisfy this condition at every one of the crossings. So that's always in there in the universe of possibilities, but it's not a very interesting possibility. So most of the time we end up throwing away trivial colorings uh, and really trying to focus on the ones that actually do use all of the colors that are at our disposal. So if we're asking whether or not this knot 5-1 can be three colored using all three of the colors, it doesn't seem like that's possible. The only way to do it is to throw away a couple of our colors and just use a single one. So that's what coloration problems tend to look like in knot theory. You give me a knot, I try to color it in, and if I can color it in in such a way that uses all of my colors and it follows this scheme up here, then that's great. Maybe there's more than one way to do that. Maybe there's a ton of ways to do that. But the key observation is that the number of different ways to color in a knot, we hope, is going to be something that can help us distinguish between two knots that are different and which will always be the same when two knots are the same. So for which values of k will a k coloration exist? The first observation that we just saw on the previous slide is that we can always, always color in any knot. We can satisfy k coloration by just using a single color. Color the whole knot the same red, for example. Because in this case, every single crossing is going to meet the first criterion, right? Which is that all at every crossing, the colors are all the same. We also can always choose to color every arc of my knot a different color. So that if I have D arcs in my knot, I could grab D different crayons and color every arc a different color. If I do that, then this is also going to be a valid coloration because now at every single crossing, all of the three colors that meet at that crossing are going to be guaranteed to be distinct. So these colorations are always possible. The real interesting question is, what about in the in-betweens? Can I use more than one but fewer than D number of colors to color a knot diagram? And that's where the interesting parts happen. And the smallest value of k for which this is an interesting question, because you can convince yourself that two colorations are actually not possible, the smallest value for which it is an interesting question is k equals 3. And so we can get a lot of mileage and use out of thinking about three colorations of knots. And then we're going to do that over the next couple of slides. But the question that you might ask is, does whether or not a knot is k colorable depend on how we diagram that knot? If you give me a different diagram for the same knot, am I guaranteed to come to the same conclusions about colorability if you change the diagram without changing the knot? Fortunately for us, the answer is no. In other words, the colorability that we defined on the previous slide is not a property of the diagram of a knot, but it's actually an intrinsic property of the knot itself, regardless of which diagram is used to represent that knot. In other words, it's an invariant. Colorability is a knot invariant. And how we know that is that we can apply the three Reitermeister moves and ask the question, if a knot was colorable before a Reitermeister move, will it guaranteed still be colorable afterwards? We can check that just by looking at each of the three Reitermeister moves in turn. For a type 1 move, where I have this little loop happening here, because there's a loop here, that means that this entire arc is all going to be colored the same color. And so I'm going to get two arcs incident on my crossing that are guaranteed to have the same color when a type 1 Reitermeister move is possible. That then guarantees for a colorable knot that that third arc has to have the same color as the first two. And therefore, if I then apply the Reitermeister type 1 untwisting maneuver to that, I'm going to get a single arc that all has that same color. And so if this was colorable before the Reitermeister move, it remains colorable after that Reitermeister move. So the Reitermeister type 1 move is, is fine. Colorability is an invariant of the type 1 Reitermeister move. For type 2, we're talking about these little loops. And again, in these diagrams, we end up with two crossings, but those two crossings share an arc in common for the type 2 setup. And that must mean that if this overstrand here has a color, then 
both of these strands incident on that are going to have to have the same color because they're parts of the same arc. So if I color it, let's say I color it the same color, let's say I color it all red. Well, that's kind of boring because if it's all the same color, just like with the type 1 move, when I apply the type 2 move to slide that loop out, um, I'm still, I can still just color everything the same color and we have a valid coloration still. And so these are really only interesting questions when we start with arcs of different colors. So maybe I have a blue strand over on this side, and it has to be the same blue coming into both because, again, it's the same arc. And then on the other side of my overstrand, I've got a different color. Let's say that it's yellow. So is there a way to do the type 2 Reitermeister move to preserve colorability in this next diagram? And the good news is that we don't have any crossings afterwards, so it doesn't really matter what we do. Um, but we can keep the same yellow coloration down here in this other strand, and we have still a valid coloration uh, for this. So type 2 Reitermeister moves also preserve the feature of colorability for a knot. And the type 3 move, the most interesting one, I think, um, is the one in which we have a crossing, and then we have another strand that passes underneath two strands of that crossing. And the question is, what's going to happen to colorability here? If we color everything the same color, it's again a trivial question. So we're going to start by coloring in this crossing over here with three different colors, red for the over, and then green and blue for the unders. And the question is, uh, if this is all going to be part of a colorable knot, how do I color in these three arcs over here? I'm forced to color the one that's in between the, the red and the green here. That one's got to be blue, because I can't color it red and I can't color it green. Um, and then I'm also forced into coloring the one on the top red, because it has a green and a blue that are incident. And the one on the bottom has got to be green, because it has a red and a blue that are already incident. So I'm forced into this coloration. Now, after I apply the type 3 Reitermeister move, it's going to slide this understrand from the left side of the crossing to the right side of the crossing. Will it still be three colorable according to our rules? And the answer is, sure. All I have to do is show that I can color in these three arcs in a, in a convenient way. Sure enough, I can. Between the red and the blue, I have to have a green. North of the red, I have to have a blue because we already have a red and a green. And south of the blue, we have to have a red because we already have a blue and a green. And so colorability of a knot is also an invariant of the type 3 Reitermeister move. So, so far, we're in great shape. We've defined what it means for a knot to be k-colorable, and we've shown that this is not a property that depends on how we draw the diagram. This is legitimately a property, intrinsic property, of the underlying knot. And so we don't have to worry about not having the right diagram to determine whether or not it's colorable. So the next question is, how do we turn colorability from a sort of a crayons geometry kind of problem, how do we turn it into an algebra problem so that we can begin to build algebraic structure on top of it? That's where we're going to go next.